Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I'm Joel. And we are here today to do a Friday Reads video, but this Friday Reads video is going to wrap up the reading that we did in the month of June, our Pride reading for Pride Month. And uh, just a quick update, uh, Jamie had surgery on Tuesday to remove a mammary tumor. She has been doing really well. She was actually a rock star for a couple of days and didn't even need the cone or that we rigged up a t-shirt. You rigged up a t-shirt because you're better at those things than me um, uh, to try to keep her away from it. And she got out of it really quickly. Terriers are smart. Um, but she was not bothering anything at all. So we managed to have her with no cone and no shirt for a couple of days. This morning, she got interested in the drain, so she's wearing the cone now. Yeah. They took the drain out, but uh, she's staring at us <laughs> really unhappily <laughs> right now. Uh, they told us to keep the cone on for today, at least, because uh, she might still be interested in the spot where the drain came out. But she's doing really well. Thank you, everyone, for the well Thank wishes you. and for thinking of her and for continuing to say be very supportive about Guinness. Uh, deeply appreciated. But we have a lot of books to talk about for the month of June. Yeah, I had a good reading month, so... <laughs> you had a really good reading month. He read way more than me, so we're actually... I read seven books. You I read think I read 13. 13 so. I'm pretty sure it's 13. Yeah. So I'm going to let you start, okay. and then when we get to the point where I've, I, you have seven left, we'll start talking about the books that I read okay. as well. And a lot of the books Greg has already read and suggested to me. And, yeah, so I can talk about them. And I, I will... Uh, do a disclaimer, I do audiobooks a whole lot better, and so that's why I get a few more on Greg, because I can do audiobooks while I am at work he's, a little bit easier. He's humble. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first book I read in the month of June was Matrix by Lauren Groff. Um, Greg really liked it. I liked it. It was really good. Yeah. It was really weird, but it was a very fun read. Yeah, I don't think you liked it as much as I did. No. But I loved it. Yeah. I really did. Um, lesbian girl boss nun. I mean... It was, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So, uh, the second book I read was Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing by Lauren Huff. Which I read in, I think, April. Yes. Yeah. And I really liked it. It was... Um, um, interesting. She had a very interesting life very, and, yeah. um, a lot of things, but it, she was a lot of things in her adult life, but she was nothing in her childhood. And I guess I kind of relate to that. So, yeah, I th it was a little, like, I liked the, I don't, I listened to it on audio and you listened to it on audio I as did. well. I liked the parts that were narrated by Kate Blanchett better. <laughs> and I can't tell if that's because those sections were better or if, because Kate Blanchett is just such a great narrator. She is. Uh, Kate Blanchett has this great voice, mm. and no offense to Lauren, mm. she was a little bit more quiet and blonde. Yeah. Not really into it like um, Kate Blanchett was. Yeah, and I don't think you would have noticed at all except that Kate Blanchett was there. And I think what happened is, I think some of the essays in it had been previously written and recorded. And from what I... Because Charlie from Montana Book Company recommended it and that mentioned this part. I think Kate Blanchett read us some of the essays or heard some of them and said, if you do a full book, I want to do the audio book. So I think some of them had already been recorded and then Kate Blanchett added new ones. I think I could yeah. be wrong about that, but yeah, but she did anyway. a good job. Yeah. The third book was, uh, the 57 bus. This was interesting. It was a true story. Uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't know about this. It was in San Francisco area, the Bay area. Um, two high school kids, um, ride a bus to and from school. They go to different schools. Their uh, travel time overlapped by eight minutes. Hmm. One, and the girl was kind of agender, and the boy um, was from a really rough neighborhood, African American. Uh, hmm. The agender was white. And one day on the bus, this boy decided it'd be fun to just light her skirt on fire, hmm. and it burnt over like. 60 70 percent of her body and it was kind of how these eight minutes led to different lives for both these kids um a little slow but it was it was really interesting and really sad too yeah you had told me about it this month and i have it saved on script but i didn't think i could do a story like that <laughs> this um, month so the so. 57 bus by yeah. dashka slater yeah uh, really good if you want to do a true crime. Yeah, um, and I think you did that for a true crime for the Montana Book Company's 2022 reading challenge, yes, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So. 
So I needed a little gay romance in my life. And so I did Heroes in Love by David C. Dawson. And this was cute. Um, it was um, these two gay men, they just meet. And... Um, Jamie needed attention. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> these two gay men, they just meet. And um, the one is a caretaker for an older man. And the older man had a really cool backstory. And so basically the book was, is it the young couple who find the love or is it the older couple that find the love? And it was actually really kind of endearing and sweet. It sounded like, and that was kind of something we both needed. Yes. This month. Uh, the fifth book I read was John and Jackie by T.J. Clune. Mm -hmm. uh, T.J. did The House by the Cerulean Sea. And I wanted to do another book by him. And this was kind of a really kind of a short um, novel. It was about these two men, and they didn't lead up to what was going on. But they met when they were 12 years old, and they were celebrating their um, 70th, 73rd birthday. And... One was dying, and the other needed to give him a gift. And um, the gift was going back to five different times in their life that led up to where they were today. Mm -hmm. It was actually very sweet. It was a cute little story. It seemed that In the beginning, it seemed like you weren't quite sure about it, but you seemed to like it by the end. I got so. into it at the end, because yeah. I, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then come to the end... It's very sad, um, but it was a little endearing, too. Okay, so, that's good. The next book I read was The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. A really good book is about two slaves after the um, they became free, and they traveled down the road to get work with a, another farmer. And um, it was kind of their life after being free and the challenges that they faced. But then there's another backstory of two Confederate uh, soldiers that had a love affair. Mm. And That's it, scandalous. It's very scandalous. Yeah, my. Uh, but then it gets a little twisted and um, really kind of got um, really sad towards oh. the end. So oh. it's, not, it's not a happy book, but it's yeah. A Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. I believe it was an Oprah Book Club pick. I th believe it was, and it had landed on my radar last year because it was on the long list for the Booker Prize, and then you got me the audio on Libro, right. and I never listened to it. <laughs> so you finally did. So uh, it, it was good. Um, I I think so far every book I've read, I've given at least a three star or higher. Uh, nothing I didn't dislike. Yeah. So and I'm glad you got to it. Now uh, this is where I jump in for the first time because now we. have seven books left and that that that's that's my level for this month uh so this was actually a book that carried over from may i started it on audio in may didn't finish it in time but it is an lgbtq book so it was fine it is ma and me by putsada rang and i really liked this book a lot it's a non-fiction book i can't remember how it ended up on my radar but it's the story of her life and she was born in i think it was cambodia and her parents were refugees, and she was actually an infant as they were on the journey. And um, she almost died as a baby while they were fleeing the country. And uh, the person who was captaining the boat that they were on told her mother, that baby's dead, just throw it overboard, save us the weight. And her mother refused and held on to her until they got to uh, the camp where they were going. And it turned out she was alive. The doctor managed to nurse her back to health. So... That sort of sets off the dynamic of the relationship between this mother and daughter and how she always feels like she owes the mother because this is a story that her mother really loves to tell. And she feels like she needs to be the perfect Cambodian daughter as she is being raised in America now. And the problem is she can't really... She comes to the conclusion eventually that she can't be the perfect Cambodian daughter because she's a Cambodian-American daughter and she can't be what her mother sort of expects and her mother is sort of desperately clinging to all of their traditions from her home country and also dealing with a lot of survivor's guilt because it wasn't until they years later that they found out about the terrible things that happened in Cambodia after they left um, the killing fields and all that and just dealing with terrible survivor's guilt and then it gets weaponized when Pusada Rang realizes she's a lesbian and that creates a really big rift between her and her mother 
and because her mother still wants her to marry a man and so have kids and can't imagine her life without that. So for that goes on for years until they are almost estranged from each other. And it was a, it's a really beautiful nonfiction book. I loved it a lot. So. Uh, Greg told me about it when we'd go on walks with the dogs and it, it, it kind of catch me up every day and it sounded really interesting. Yeah, it really was. So, all right, what was your next one? The next book I did was, um, I can hold it. If you want. <laughs> the one I talked about last week, uh, all the young men by Ruth Coker Burks, uh, very good book. Sad too. Yeah. Um, about a woman who in Arkansas started taking care of AIDS patients because nobody else would. Yeah. And it's kind of going through her life of all the patients she took care of. Um, it was actually really kind of interesting, a little point in the book. She keeps talking about her friend, Bill, and that finally comes out, it's Governor Bill Clinton. Mm. And um, who did the blurb yes. right there. This book will make you love Ruth as much as I do. So, um Really good book. Uh, a little sad, but um, I, I love historical um, nonfiction books like this that tell me a little bit about um, things I didn't know about growing up. So it's yeah. actually a good book. Highly recommend it. Yeah, I, w I definitely want to read it. It just this was not a good month for me to be doing something like this. I'm impressed you managed to get through it. I started earlier in the month yeah. and I just skimmed it towards the end when yeah, things when started things going went. bad around the house. So. Yeah. Um, and then the caveat for it is that there are some people who say that they have not been able to verify details of her story. And there was a GoFundMe uh, where she said she was going to do a memorial for the people that uh, she helped bury who died of AIDS. And um, that memorial has not been built yet. And she has declined to comment. But um, it still seems like a worthwhile book. A lot of people have liked it. And I, I still want to read it at some point. I just feel like that. Put that out there. Full for full. Good book. awareness, yeah. And then mine was Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. I loved this book. I had wanted to read it for a very long time and not gotten around to it, and I'm really glad that I finally did because I just adored this book. It is was published in 1970, and it's about a woman who grows up, I want to say, in the 1950s. Um, she is a lesbian, and she realizes that when she's very young, and she is this really strong character. I love her so much. <laughs> and she um, is very outspoken and very confident about who she is, and she thinks that if she can just push through and ignore what people think about her, she can make the world, she can find the life that she wants. And then, of course, as she grows up, the world is much more complicated than that. It reminded me of other things that I love. The the jacket remind, it says uh, describes Molly Bolt, the protagonist, as a sort of female Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. Uh, Huckleberry Finn is the one they say. And uh, I think that's true, but I'd say there's also a dash of fried green tomatoes in here. It, the ending reminded me of Maurice, which is one of my favorite, my, maybe my favorite book. Um, so I loved this and would absolutely recommend it. It was perfect Pride Month reading. Uh, and I've started Maurice this week, so I'm just a couple of chapters into it, but uh, really good. It's going to be a challenging read for me, yeah. but I'm going to hang in there. My next book was Chef's Kiss by T.J. Alexander. Mm. This is really good because I wanted to read a book. Uh, their character in there was agender, and there was a transgender, and then a lesbian. Mm. And all three of these characters kind of tied together beautifully. Mm. And um, it was a story of a pastry chef who I'm very passionate about. So He's a good pastry chef. And um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. And um, I wanted to read something just fun, lighthearted, and silly. And this was perfect. I imagine after reading all the young men and everything that was going on at home, that yeah, it was yeah. essential. It so, was. Yeah. Um, good book. I recommend it. And um, it was sweet. And then my next one was The Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran, which, thank God, I read before, <laughs> earlier in the month, before everything got bad with Guinness, because it is very much about death <laughs> and dying and aging and all of that stuff. Um, Andrew Holleran wrote Dancer from the Dance, which is sort of a classic LGBTQ novel, and he had not written anything else in a while. And I feel like I, I did want the book to be more like what someone who had survived... Dancer from the Dance, would how they would look at the world now and what gay culture would be like for them. And it really wasn't. It was much more about aging and dying and the, the process of decline and all that, which was interesting. But um, 
I liked it. I didn't love it. But uh, I, I think there's definitely a lot to talk about in the book. And it's really well done. It's beautifully written. So I'm glad I read it. And I'm glad I read it early in the month. <laughs> Uh, the next one I did was Bad to Be Merry. Um, it was silly as nonsense, very short. Which was it, necessary. It was a novella by Andrew Gray. Um, two men that were in love. One was a man with a child and the other was an ex-mobster. And it's how they wanted to celebrate Christmas because they had totally separate or opposite uh, Christmas traditions. And then they had to come together as a family to do one Christmas. It was it was sweet. I liked it. It was like a hundred pages. I just needed something to, silly to get me through the night one day. So I yeah. did that. And nothing wrong with that. Uh, my next one was Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature last year. And I was a little interested in it before that. But her speech at the National Book Award ceremony is actually what made me immediately call Montana Book Company and order it <laughs> because she just gave a really great speech about the importance of queer representation, especially in the young adult market and how it has been challenged recently. I really loved this book. I thought it was fantastic. And it does, I, sometimes I struggle with historical fiction because it feels like the author will do a lot of research into what the time was like. And then they kind of sort of clumsily throw that stuff in there. And they also use the benefit of what they know now to shape their characters and give them knowledge that somebody who lived at the time might not usually have. And she does a really great balance of that. Like I think in one of my Friday Reads videos, I mentioned I had never really thought about what it would be like to live during the space race because I know what how the space race turned out and anything else I've read or watched also knows that it's going to turn out. But the character in this book wants to be, she's really fascinated with astrophysics and like rocket science and things like that. Um, and it kind of puts you in that headspace of wondering like what the space race was going to be, how, if anybody was ever going to get to the moon. And that was really interesting, but also, um, she is an Asian American, uh, teenager at the time the red scare was happening so her father's citizenship is threatened he had come over as a student and gotten a, a job and at the same time she is discovering that she is a lesbian and uh her journey is sort of parallel to that and it does very interesting things with that and talks about how homosexuality was criminalized at the time and I loved it. I thought it was a really great book. I would certainly recommend it. So that was my next one. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, my next book was All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. Mm. Um, it was a quick read, too. And I wanted to read a little something um, nonfiction, memoir-ish. And uh, it's a really good book. It was just basically about it. a boy. Greg said he'd really liked it, so I thought I would, yeah. too. Um it's just about a boy growing up gay and um, kind of what he went through in life. So, uh, good book. Really yeah. liked it. And it's one of the most frequently challenged books these days, which is another reason it's kind of important for more people to read. Challenged on banned books? Or banned, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, it's just a story about growing up when you don't conform to what the idea of what you should be is. And how, it, it, what I, one of the other things I really love about it is that he gives, he recognizes, like, some of this stuff is a little bit personal. I wouldn't ordinarily share this, but, like, you're not going to get sex ed in school, and somebody needs to talk, to talk to you about this, which is one of the reasons it's frequently challenged, but at the same time, who's going to teach gay youth about any of this stuff? So yeah. that's one of the, another reason I really loved the book. My next one was The House in the Cerulean Sea. Yay! So, obviously, spoiler alert, I bought a copy. <laughs> yes, you'll find out. <laughs> Uh, in my July book haul, but I went, uh, I traded in a bunch of books at the, um, a used bookstore and they had this, so I picked it up. I loved it that much. It was really great. Um, you had read it last year. I loved it. And loved it. And a friend of ours read it last year and loved it. Um, your stepmother read it last year or this year. She yeah. did it this year and loved it. Um, so I knew I needed to get around to it. And I really, this was about the point where uh, things were getting bad with Guinness. So I really needed a distraction, and I think the first half of the book probably suffered because I wasn't paying great attention, and I would get confused about some who some of the characters, like the kids were. I knew who they all were, I just couldn't put a name to the character. 
But I really love this book, and uh, I, I think it says a lot about, because these kids are, they, they're on an orphanage on an island, they've been classified as dangerous or magical, and this person, Linus Baker, has been sent to the island. Uh, it's his job to evaluate the places where these kids are kept to see if they are being properly cared for, if proper cautionary measures are being taken, and he has been sent to this island, which is top secret, to evaluate the school. There is an unusual sort of headmaster figure, Arthur Parnassus, looking over the kids. One of the kids is the Antichrist. <laughs> we don't use that word. But we don't use that word. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I really love about this book, because it... And I think that there is definitely an LGBTQ, oh. like, element to this. Like, 100%, yeah. there's an obvious... It's not like the theme is hidden, it's there. But... Some of the subtler things in the book also really speak to that because it's about how people put you in boxes that try to define who you are and they're afraid of you because they make assumptions about you. But especially in the situation of these, it's like they're just kids. Just raise them, care for them and love them and they'll be fine. And I thought that was a really beautiful message. It hit me right here for sure. It was really sweet. Yeah. So it does have all the feels. It's yeah. really good. I would really, really recommend this as a young adult if um, somebody who has a kid, not necessarily gay mm -hmm. or different, but just different. Yeah. Just not your normal kid. Mm -hmm. And I'm, whether it can be a medical or physical, um, because all these kids were, the kids were creatures. They weren't kids. They were creatures. Yeah. But. They were kids. Yeah. And they were all really sweet, sweet kids. Uh, the One of them, Chauncey, is it? Chauncey. Who, <laughs> nobody really knows what he is. He's just, but he's been told that he's a monster, so he's ashamed of himself and afraid, and he feels like he needs to hide under beds to scare people because he's been told that he's a monster. And it's a part of his journey is realizing he doesn't have to be that. He can have dreams of and ambitions of his own. And I just, I loved it. It was really, it was really great. And actually, it would be really good, not just for kids who are going through things like that, but I think their parents as well. Um, and I don't do a lot of sci-fi fantasy, but this is, it's like kind of light fantasy. Like, even though there are yeah. magical kids, and uh, and also, I, I, I am like a born rule follower, so I really relate to, <laughs> to Linus Baker, the protagonist of this book. Um, because it's just like, I even, I've told you this story. I didn't, and I think I've mentioned this in a video before. I hated Curious George mm -hmm. when I was a kid because I somebody would try to read me a Curious George book, and I would get angry. I'd be like, "The man in the yellow hat told him not to do that." So I am Linus Baker in a lot of ways. Anyway, I loved it. So great book, great book. My next book was that we talked about last week was Nick Offerman's "Where the Deer and the Antelope Play." Mm -hmm. I'm giving Nick a pass for Gay Pride Month because he is a little gay icon bear. He is. He's yeah. adorable. He is. Um, it's just kind of his random thoughts and his fun, crazy verbiage of just silliness. Mm. But it's political, which I kind of see his points. And uh, great book. Really, really good book to just, I mean, you talk about the national parks, what's happening. Mm. Um, he, it is a pandemic book because the pandemic yes. hits like halfway through as he's writing it. And right. he talk, so he gets a little political about that. Not too political, but a little bit. But he and his wife, Megan Mullally, love her. Love her. Um, they buy a RV and they call it the Nutmeg. The Nutmeg. I just <laughs> so love that. <laughs> and so they travel across country and they, they do things with friends. It actually starts off in Montana and he talks yeah. about huckleberries and, and which we love. We love huckleberries might have helped convince me to move to Montana because they're a uh, Pacific Northwest. Is it just Pacific Northwest or really just the Rockies? The More the Rockies. High? Yeah. Pacific Northwest. So, so it's like magic. a blueberry, but a little tartar. Very tart. What did I say? At our wedding, I called them Jesus magic. And they are. They are. The, um, where is the lie? Great book. Where <laughs> the deer is. and the antelope play. Yeah. Uh, Rome. Uh, play yeah. by Nick Offerman. I read it earlier this year and I, I, I really enjoyed it. He reads the audio, so you really can't go wrong yeah. with that. Uh, my next book was... It's a really short audio. I would absolutely recommend it to a lot of people. It's Amateur, A Reckoning with Gender Identity and Masculinity by Thomas Page McBee. I listened to it on audio, but I had I had purchased this copy. And for a long time, it was not available on audio, and now it is. But I'm happy to have a copy of the book. Um, basically, Thomas Page McBee is a transgender man. And the book is about him trying to find where he fits in the space of masculinity 
how he struggles with feeling like he needs to prove something. So what he does is he agrees to a charity boxing match. And the book is sort of about his journey training in boxing. Now, I am really aggressively not a fan of boxing. <laughs> don't like it. Don't want to watch it. So I admit, I did feel a little bit alienated from the parts of the book that are really hardcore into him training uh, in boxing. But the point of all that is really interesting because part of the journey, and I think actually you would really love this part, is about he feels like he can't really be open as a trans man in the gym where he trains. And um, sometimes he's wrong about the when he assumes that the people in the gym would be upset with him for being a transgender man in the gym. And I don't want to spoil the ending. Um, but he really struggles with that, especially as someone who had grown up. Um, he talks a lot about his relationship with his brother and his sister and how the dynamic changed when he came out as a transgender man and started the transition process. And I thought that was really interesting because he sort of has to redefine his relationship with his sister. And it is all talked about in very interesting ways. And I can relate to a lot of it. I, I mean, I'm not a transgender man, but I, I am not someone who adheres to the masculine ideal a lot. Like, I don't know how to fix a car. I'm not into sports. I would rather watch a musical <laughs> and all that stuff. So take my experience and amplify it by like a lot. And you have what Thomas Page McBee went through. And I found it really interesting. Um, and it, like I said, I could relate to a lot of it, even if I only got a small fraction of what he went through. And I think it's just important because it's also, you realize so many of these gender stereotypes and con the gender conditioning that we go through are kind of silly. So, yeah. Anyway, what, what's your next one? All right, my next one. This was a gift from Erica at the Broken Spine. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Uh, but it was picked out by Montana Book Company. And, um, oh my God, what a great book. Uh, it is The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle, Entwistle by Matt Cain. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely adorable story. Um, a little bit along the lines of A Man Called Ove, or O.V., however you say it, yeah. uh, by Frederick Bachman. Um, he's kind of this old curmudgeon um, postal worker very shy. Very shy. Very withdrawn. Doesn't get out. Doesn't do anything. He's had one love in his life and it got ruined. 50 years later, the post office forces him to retire. And he's like, starts living life. Yeah. The people he meets and he goes searching for the man of his, his lifelong love that he left when he was 17 and his journey to find this man, but the journey to find himself. Mm. And I know that sounds cheesy, but wonderful, wonderful book. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. And I am almost done with it. Actually, you can see my bookmark toward the end. I, I am on page 290, I think of 390. Yeah. So I have about 100 pages left. And I, I agree with everything you've said. It's a really charming book. And actually, what's really where it is kind of a perfect choice from Erica and the people at Montana Book Company, particularly Abby. Um, so Erica and Abby did a fantastic job now selecting this because it's also a little bit about dealing with and processing grief. And that's the reason Erica had sent it to us. And, um, like... Albert has, both of his parents are gone. He does, like, spoiler alert, he, his cat does die in this book. And I hadn't known that. Um, so that was a little bit devastating and hard, given uh, everything we are going through. But it's also about him start as he steps out, he starts to process his grief. And all of the things that he had bottled up inside of himself, which it almost feels cathartic for me. And I hope it's yes. kind of the same for you. And I'm just really enjoying it. And I think it's also really important because the way he grew up, he felt shame about being a gay man yeah. and being in love with a man. And he assumed in many ways that it never got better. And because he shut out the world so hard, he part of his journey is discovering that society has changed. And yes, there are still challenges to it, but he can live an open and honest life. And I think it's important because I think a lot of young people today would probably look at him and not really understand why he shut the world out. And it's also about the importance of being out and what it means to have representation in the world. And I think that's really important as well.
Yeah. But I can't wait to finish it. I wish I had finished it in June, but it's okay. It'll be my first finished book for July because I'm kind of tearing through it. I, uh, but yeah. And how was the audio? The audio was really good. The, yeah. the, the reader was, a reader can really make or break a good audio book. Uh, yeah. And the reader was very good. I will actually say I bet with a good narrator, Ruby Fruit Jungle would be magical on audio. But yeah, I, I imagine this would be a very charming book to listen to on audio. And it's also about... He has really great relationships with people that he makes as he starts coming out and talking. And I love that what he finds along the way, and I'm not done with the book, so I don't think this is a spoiler. Um, he starts finding that when he's open and honest with people, they like him. They respond well. And I, it's just, I, I love that message. Yeah. So, um, But there was actually one other book that I head read in June. Uh, I listened to it on audio. It's a three-hour audiobook, just like Amateur, so I listened to it really quickly. It's Gay Like Me, A Father Writes to His Son by Richie Jackson, and actually a lot of it picks up on um, some of the things I was talking about from The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle. So Richie Jackson is gay. He and his boyfriend at the time, B.D. Wong, the actor, had had two sons, like twins, via surrogate, but one of them died. It's actually, it was really upsetting. You just started it, so yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had from I had failed to mention that they lost one of the twins. So, content warning. <laughs> Eventually, uh, he and B.D. Wong break up. He marries somebody else. Once marriage equality becomes a thing, and hopefully, it won't be taken away. Uh, whole other topic. But anyway, uh, his son has now come out as gay, just as he's about to go to college. So he writes a sort of this book as a sort of message to his son, and. It's about a lot of the different ways that they grew up and how he doesn't want his son to feel complacent about growing up in the, like, post-Ellen world um, where people can talk about being gay. His son is able to be open in ways that he was never able to, but he doesn't want his son to feel complacent. He wants him to remember where we've been and everything that he went through as a young gay man and all the struggles that he had um, because they haven't gone away. And the, all of the Supreme Court rulings over the last week really just go to show it's like the fight is not over. You need to be vigilant. And he talks to him about it's like you feel comfortable in the world and that's a good thing, but you do always need to have your eye open. But he talks about the importance of being out and how he learned this from Harvey Firestein. Um, being out is important because it helps you, even if you're not really doing anything, just the act of being out helps lift up the people who can't be out. And if you go to Pride, you can help celebrate and support and send messages to the people who can't go to Pride and be out and sell the confident. And I thought it was really great messages, very important. It was the perfect way to cap off my Pride Month reading, I think. And you just started it. I just I don't started know how far it. You are. a couple of chapters, but it's yeah. really good. So really looking uh, looking forward to talking more with you more once you finish the book. I will say there was a little part in the first half where it dipped just a little bit too much into memoir for me. And that felt a little name droppy because he works in theater. So he talks about his wedding and mentions a bunch of the people who were there. He does, Donald Trump and Melania were at his wedding and he talks about how horrified he is. But I feel like even in 2012, you kind of knew Donald Trump and Melania were not great people, but... Not going to argue with that. So, like, there's a moment where it dips a little too much into sort of name-dropping memoir, but then it comes right back. All of the parts where he's talking to his son are fantastic. Yeah. So, um, what were you going to say? Um, I think one of the big things I got from all my reading, because I read a lot of different types of books, mm -hmm. um, for Pride Month. It was Pride Month. We did go to a women's march. Mm -hmm. And one thing Greg and I talked about at the women's march is... Where are the bears? Yeah. Where are the gay bears? Because we're all in this together. Yeah. It's we're, like the gay men are there for the women and their reproduction rights. Just because we're not going to have kids doesn't mean we can't support them. And we got a lot of praise for that. But where were the, the bears? Yeah. And then also, when we're up for um, equal equality and marriage rights, I'm sure a lot of these people who are fighting for women's rights are going to be there with us. Yeah. So we're all in this together. We need to be there for them. Because it's true. We go to Pride in Helena every year. And when we went to the Women's March in Helena last weekend, we did not see a lot of the men that we would usually see there. Which was really disappointing yeah. for both of us. Because it's it's essentially the same fight. 
we have yeah. to be here for women and just like women will stand up for I know women will stand up for us. Yeah. And the EPA so. is coming up too. So we yeah. need to fight for them too. So just because it's not in our personal circle doesn't mean we don't need to fight. So let's all fight. Yeah, I agree. That's perfect. So that is our Pride Month reading. Uh, I'd love to hear what you read, what you enjoyed. If you have thoughts about any of these books, please put them in the comment section down below. Jamie is pacing and being impatient. <laughs> she wants attention. She's been getting fussed over all week, so I'm not really surprised. But so uh, we'll end it here and go fuss on Jamie. And as always, I really appreciate your time. Happy Pride. If you want to do a Pride summer like Jen the Librarian is doing, <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to read LGBTQ books yeah. in July, but I have a couple of other things. Um, but anyway, thank you for your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading. Thanks.